Hey there, I just wanted to take a minute and welcome you to Geneseo Evangelical Free Church. We are so thankful that this resource was made available to you and that it will bless you in your walk with the Lord. We also pray that this resource would be used in conjunction with you belonging to a local church body. And if that means you need to make a trip to visit us, we would love that opportunity. If you haven't made a connection with us in person, we would love to take a few minutes and get to know you a little bit better and also learn how we can best serve you with the ministries we have at Geneseo e If you're looking for more resources that are available to you or you want more information about our church and our ministries, you can visit gefc.org. That's G-E-F-C. Org, and you can contact us at any time that you need. But at this time, we pray that this message would bless you. Well, good morning, church family. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm Pastor Ryan. I oversee evangelism and discipleship here at Geneseo E Free Church. And I would invite you to turn in your Bibles, not to the Gospel of Matthew, (laughs) but to the last book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And we are going to look at chapter 21, and we're going to study verses 1 through 6 together. There you are. It's good to see your faces. We're going to study verses 1 through 6 together in a message that is titled, Out with the Old and In with the New. And now that 2023 is right at our doorstep, I'm sure many of us have looked back over 2022, and there are just certain areas of our lives that we want to do over again. Maybe you set financial goals for yourself that you just didn't accomplish. Maybe you committed to going to the gym more, but you just didn't make it. Maybe you committed to having a deeper walk with Jesus, but you just don't feel like you're there. I think we wish that life had a rewind button at times, but it doesn't. But as God's people, as his church, let's remember going into 2023, every day that he gives us, God's mercies They're new every single morning for his children. And so in our passage today, we're going to see God, the creator of heaven and earth, usher in the granddaddy of all do-overs. And that brings me to the first point, the promise of a new creation. Look at verse 1 with me. John writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. This world, as we sit here today in church this morning, is marching toward its grand finale. When the curtains will close on human history for the final time. But as God's people... We have nothing to fear what awaits us in the future. God has given his church, his bride, the book of Revelation to lay out for us how human history is going to end. We're not in the dark. And it's unfortunate because pulpits across America today are silent on the book of Revelation. Many Christians don't even study this book. They avoid it. And yet in the first chapter, we're told that if we'll read it, we'll read Revelation, we'll obey what it says, brothers and sisters, God will bless us. Revelation, in a nutshell, is a blessing book. And so, Revelation gives us a roadmap to redemption. And it shows us the prophetic events, the end time events that need to happen before Revelation chapter 21 and 22 can be fulfilled. And I just want to lay those out for you real quickly so you you understand what is happening 
in the book before these two chapters. The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. And it can happen at any moment. It's when the believing will be leaving. We'll be out of here to the glory of God. And it can happen at any moment. Be ready, saints. After the rapture comes the seven-year tribulation period here on earth. God pours his judgment out on this world. Then comes Jesus' second coming when he returns to earth in power and glory. And he defeats his enemies. Then comes the millennial kingdom. The thousand-year reign of Jesus on this earth. And after that's the final judgment. And then comes the eternal state where we will dwell with God for eternity. And so in these six verses that are before us this morning, John is giving us a taste of heaven, a glimpse of glory. John wrote Revelation while he was being persecuted for his faith. That should be an encouragement to us. God uses us in the midst of our trials to advance his kingdom. John wrote this book somewhere between 95 to 95 A.D. or 90 to 95 A.D. on the Isle of Patmos. And throughout Revelation, God gives John a series of visions. And if you look with me in verse 1, they always begin with this phrase. Do you see it in verse 1? Then I saw. What God is revealing to John here in these verses before us is what will happen after the final judgment. The new heavens and the new earth. Now this might come as no shock to you, but I'm not that creative. Okay, Pastor Steve and Cole, they're pretty creative guys. You probably caught on to that. We didn't plan it this way, but in our latest sermon series, Christmas in Genesis, we've been learning why we're going to get a new heavens and a new earth. Pastor Steve has eloquently laid out for us why that's going to happen. See, Adam and Eve's sin not only polluted humanity, but it polluted this world, this creation. You want proof of that? You put a lamb in a pit with a lion at the zoo and you see what happens. This world is under the bondage of sin. This creation. And Paul writes of this in Romans 8.22. Here is what he says, and it's up on the screen. Paul says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Now for the women in that room, that verse means a whole lot more than it does the men. And what Paul is saying to us here is this world right now is experiencing contractions because it has been stained by sin. But with those birth pains awaits something greater. The new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Now, contrary to to popular opinion and belief, this world that experiences these earthquakes, these natural disasters, floods, the temperatures that tried to kill us a week ago, the 115 degree heat index, you can count me out, has nothing to do with global warming, but it has everything to do with this world being stained by sin. And as much as I hate the expression, we got to give the devil his due. Because his evil influence has tainted this earth. And the heavenly places where he is currently allowed to roam. But it won't always be this way. God has purposed an eternity past to remedy this problem. Because God is perfect, he can't dwell 
in the presence of sin and neither can his people. So he has something great that is awaiting us. How will God usher in this grand remodel project? How will he accomplish it? Well, the Apostle Peter tells us after the, the final judgment recorded for us in Revelation chapter 20 when the, the unrighteous dead are resurrected and they stand before Jesus at the great white throne and are cast into the lake of fire for eternity. After that moment, God's purifying fire, sanctifying fire will sweep across this planet, purging it of any remaining sin and unrighteousness, preparing it for his saints. Think of it like those brush fires that you see out in the middle of a field. Some that are controlled, maybe some that are not, where people burn off the grass to cause new growth. That's what God is doing here. And Peter records this in his epistle. Second Peter Chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, here's what he writes. He says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and earth in which righteousness dwells. So what will the new heavens and the new earth look like? The Bible doesn't give us a lot of information. We wish that it would, but it just doesn't. But John gives us a hint of what is to come. He tells us that in the new earth, there'll be no sun, there'll be no moon, because God's glory will give off all the natural light that is needed. And his son, the lamb, will be the lamp. Darkness will never exist again. The nighttime sky that we walk out and look at will be gone. God will provide all the light that we need. And then John adds something some interesting detail. He tells us what else won't be there. Do you see it at the end of verse 1? He says, And the sea was no more. That means there'll be no fishing in heaven. <laughs> Are you still with me? That's good. That's good. Three quarters of this world is covered by water. In the new heavens and the new earth, that will not be there. And Pastor Steve and I believe that what God is doing is he's removing all of the water to, uh, to give the saints from all ages a place to dwell here on earth. How do we apply this, this verse to our lives? How do we take something that seems so far away and use it in our daily walk with Christ? Fix your eyes on eternity. Now you may not realize this, but we do it every day. When you get to work in the morning, you think to yourself, I cannot wait to blow this popsicle stand. I can't wait to get out of here. Right? Especially on Monday, because you're thinking, oh, where's Friday? Where's Friday at? You see what you're doing? You're living with the end in mind. That's what you're doing. But God calls his people his saints, to live beyond the week, to live beyond the year, and to fix their eyes on what awaits us in eternity. And it'll help us take our minds and our eyes off the distractions of this world that seek to derail our walk with Jesus Christ. Focus on what awaits you in eternity. And that, that brings me to the second point. A city built for saints. Look at verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. After John received the vision of the, 
the heavenly city, or the, the new heavens and the new earth, God now shows him this holy city. Just as every state has a capital, God's eternal kingdom will have a flagship city, the holy city. Think of it, think of it like a crown for the new world to wear. And it symbolizes God defeating sin, Satan, and death. But notice the characteristic of this city. John says it's holy. Do you know that in the New Testament epistles, when Paul writes to the church, he refers to, to you and to me as saints. It means we're holy. It means we've been set apart. That's a New Year's resolution waiting to happen, isn't it? The same is true of this city. It's been set apart. It's holy. For God's plans and God's purposes, it's perfect. You see, in this city, you can leave your front door unlocked and nobody's going to break in and steal anything. It's perfect. And the tragic house fire that happened here in Geneseo a week ago will be the thing of the past. That'll never happen in the new Jerusalem. Why? Because it comes down out of heaven. It's created by God for you and for me. See, whatever we touch, we tend to mess up because of sin. But what God creates, because he's the chief builder, the master builder, the, the architect, is perfect and it's flawless. So what will this heavenly city look like? Do we have blueprints? Can we go to realtor.com and look on the inside? See? John gives us a glimpse of the heavenly city. We know that it has a foundation. It has gates. It has streets of gold. The tree of life is there. And there is a, a river that flows from the throne of God. But what should impress us about this city is its size. Now, I'm not very good at math, so I didn't figure this out. Somebody did the legwork for me, okay? But when you take John's measurements, this city is 1,400 miles long, okay? 1,400 miles wide and 1,400 miles tall. Let that sink in. Now, to put that in perspective... The distance from Los Angeles, California to Dallas, Texas is 1,400 miles. God is preparing this place for us to dwell with him. Now, where will we be in the heavenly city? Jesus answered this question in John chapter 14. He told his disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them. It's a promise he makes to us as well. And I believe that place, that dwelling place, is the new Jerusalem. Think of them like apartments, these dwelling places. Now, some of you who are probably a little more introverted, you're thinking, I don't want to live that close to anybody for eternity. <laughs> Sorry, you can laugh. That's all right. Some of you that live out in the country, you're thinking, can I get some real estate outside of the city? I don't want to live that close to anybody forever. Take heart. Take heart. You won't care who your neighbor is. You won't, you won't care who your neighbor is because you will be in your perfected body. You'll be glorified just like Jesus. Your neighbor won't irritate you like they do now. It won't matter. You won't care. So what are we going to do when we get to heaven? We see the cartoons that it depicts people, you know, strumming a harp, floating on a cloud. Yeah, I know. That's not scriptural, by the way. And we don't turn into angels when we go to heaven either, just to clear the air on that one. 
Revelation 22, 3 in the NASB version tells us what we're going to do when we get there. It says, his bond servants, that's you and me, his bond servants will serve him. We will worship him. Because you see, when we're in his presence, when we see him face to face, we can do no less. And the motivation will be purely, purely out of love and nothing else. But notice in our text how the new earth receives the heavenly city. Do you see John using the the imagery of a wedding as a bride adorned for her husband? Think back to your wedding day, husbands and wives. The bride spends most of the day getting herself ready to be received at the altar by her husband. It's what God is doing for us, preparing the new Jerusalem to be received by God and his people. But the other point that John is driving at here in our text is that as believers in Jesus Christ, we have entered in to a covenantal relationship with Jesus. The most sacred relationship through salvation. He is our bridegroom and we are his bride. And in Revelation 19, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will be reunited with him, dressed in white robes of righteousness. I pray that you're you're waiting for that day. And we will be reunited with him for eternity. And so that brings me to the third point, communion with our Creator. Look at verses 3 through 4 with me. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So after John receives these two heavenly visions, he hears from the throne, a place of authority because it's where God resides, that the dwelling place of God is now with man. The declaration from the king's court is that God will now be among his people. This is foreshadowed all throughout the Bible. Going back to the Hebrew scriptures, God was among the Israelites. He was with them in the tabernacle and in the temple. And in the New Testament, I believe we have the greatest example of God being among man. We just celebrated Christmas. Where God's one and only Son took on human flesh. John chapter 1 verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John drives home this point by using two words in verse 3. Dwelling and dwell. It literally means to tabernacle with God. Have you ever went camping with your family and you've stayed in the same tent together? I mean, you may never do it again, but, but you're that close to one another. You're tabernacling together. And that's what John wants us to see here in the text. We're going to be that close with God. But I want you to know, and I want you to take this with you as you go out this week, God's not the only one who's going to be there. The Son isn't the only one who's going to be there. The Spirit isn't the only one who's going to be there. Look around this room. Do you see these people that we're here with today? In your Sunday school class, your small groups, your Bible studies, your youth groups, college and career groups, these are the people that we're going to be in community with 
for eternity. This is just a dress rehearsal. That's all it is. We're just practicing for what is to come. And don't forget this. Our, lost, our loved ones who have died in Christ and went on to glory will be reunited with them as well. They will be there. Going back to our Christmas and in Genesis series, Pastor Steve laid out for us that in the Garden of Eden, before Adam and Eve fell into sin, that they had this unbroken relationship with God. They saw him face to face. That's totally foreign to us, isn't it? And because of their sin, then this wall of separation went up between us. And so the theme of redemption that runs throughout the Bible is that what was lost, that paradise was lost in Genesis because of man's sin, will be restored in revelation by God. Paradise lost, paradise regained. It's what awaits us. Do You see in verse 4, where John tells us what it will be like to be in communion with our Creator. He says, He will wipe away every tear. Here's what that means, saints. The sorrows of this life are not going to follow us in the one to come. I can't wait. The pain, the heartache, the suffering of this world will not be a part of what is to come. Obituaries, funeral homes, visitations will be a thing of the past because John tells us death will be no more. Paul tells us it will be defeated. Why? John goes on to say that the former things have passed away. The old order will be no more. The fleshly desires that we all have to to sin, to lust, to covet, to lie, to cheat, to steal will no longer be a part of our nature. We'll never be sick. We'll never sin. We'll be perfected. And this world that we live in that's currently under the control of the evil one will be no more. And Satan will be a defeated foe. So with these promises that are made to us in Revelation, can we claim them today? Can we claim them on this side of eternity? Absolutely. We absolutely can. God gave us these two chapters in Revelation to show us that he has the final say on eternal matters. And that if we trust in the promises that he has made to us in his word, in his word, that it will give us the strength we need to face the difficulties of today. And they are many. And that brings me to the fourth point. The work is finished. Look at verses 4 through 5 with me. Or excuse me, verses 5 through 6. And he who was seated on the throne said... Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Now, whether or not you want to admit it, All of you have watched those fixer-upper shows where people sink endless amounts of money into a house just to get it the way that they want it. That's not what God is doing here in our text. He's not just going to move a couple walls and slap a three-seasons porch on the back of the house. In verse 5, Jesus says, Behold which means pay attention, 
listen, I am making all things new. We got to celebrate that today. We got to witness God making all things new. Through the testimonies of those who have been saved, those who have been born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit. God is going to do the same thing with the the heavens and the earth. They're going to be made brand new again. Imagine with me for a moment, stepping onto the new earth, walking through the gates of the new Jerusalem for the first time what that'll be like. And so our Lord commanded John to write these words down, to encourage us and to remind us of his promises because we are so prone to doubt them, are we not? And yet God says, cling to my promises that I have for you. And his words are trustworthy and true from Genesis to Revelation. And from the throne, Jesus says, it is done, in verse 5. Do you hear the echo of Calvary? As Jesus hung from the cross, pierced for our sins and transgressions, he declared, it is finished. Our sin debt had been paid in full by his sacrifice. He took our place on the cross where we couldn't. And so, the redemption of humanity is complete in our passage with the creation, the new creation of the heavens and the earth. How do we know that this is going to happen? Jesus draws upon his title as the Alpha and the Omega. He is the omnipotent creator. And he is outside of space and time. He knows the end from the beginning, and what he declares will come to pass. It's a promise that you can take to the bank. And so in verse 6, Jesus is extending the offer of salvation to the thirsty. To those whose souls are parched by the sins of this life. Have you drank from the well of living water that he has to offer. Because the water of this world will only gratify the desires of the flesh and leave you wanting more. And so Jesus declares to his children, to his followers in John chapter 7, he says these words, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It's the promise of salvation, the promise of blessing through God's Son. And so as we close, I want to leave you with two application points. The first one is promise. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said that So many people are heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good. I believe that used to be a true statement, but the tides in the evangelical church have been changing for some time now. And unfortunately, many Christians are so earthly minded that they are no heavenly good. So how do we live in this world but be faithful to God, awaiting what is to come? Well, James hits us right between the eyes. James chapter 4, verse 4, he writes these words. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Those are some hard words, but James is warning each and every one of us against spiritual adultery that we're so easily prone to. Ask yourself, going into the new year, what is your love directed toward? Is it toward God? Or is it toward the things of this world? 
And like the Philippian believers, we need to be reminded that this, this present world, it's passing away. It's like the bottom of a garbage can compared to where we're going. And that our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in, is in heaven. And until we become residents of the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth, we are to eagerly await our Savior from there. It's going to happen one of two ways. You're either going to go to him in death or he's going to come to you at his return. And as Cole taught us a couple weeks ago, we are to live our lives in active anticipation of Jesus Christ's return. And so if he came back today, would he find you living in a way that pleases him? And so we come to the second application point, prepare. How do we get ready for the life to come? The time of preparation, it begins now. Not yesterday, today. And Paul gives us our application step. What we are to do when we leave here. The demands of this passage on our souls. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. By the way, this is the verse from VBS, so the kids are going to know it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. How faithfully you serve God in this life with your time, your talents, your abilities, your spiritual gifts, your resources, everything that he has blessed you with will determine the degree of blessing that you experience in heaven. Hear me on this. Heaven will not be the same for everybody. Yes, those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus will be there. But we are exhorted throughout Scripture by our Lord to store up heavenly treasure, blessings in heaven that we will enjoy for eternity. Heavenly reward, heavenly treasure by faithful living here on earth. And so as you're preparing yourself for eternity... Ask yourself the question as you go out this week, how are you preparing those around you for eternity? Your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers who don't know Jesus. I was reminded of this principle just this week. Last Sunday, I went to visit a family friend that had been admitted to the hospital for congestive heart failure. And so Sunday night, I walked into her hospital room and I sat down at the side of her bed. And it's been a long time since we talked. And I opened the Bible to John chapter 14. And I shared with her how she could have peace with God in this life and in the one to come. Laying out the plan of salvation. And even though her physical heart was failing her, even though she was gasping to breathe, the Holy Spirit was preparing her heart to receive the seed of the gospel. And at 84 years old, she prayed in her bed to receive Jesus as Savior. And Wednesday of this week, she closed her eyes for the last time, took her last breath and went into the presence of Jesus. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Don't miss this. There's only two destinies after we die. Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We can go into eternal judgment and eternal separation or we can go into eternal blessing where God is, by trusting in his son for salvation. And so as you go out this week, be bold. Be bold. You're the bride. 
You're the church. You're Jesus' disciples. You bear his name. You're different than everybody else. Do you know that? You're unique. You're saints. You're set apart. To take the gospel to those in your sphere of influence, those that are around you that don't know him. So be bold as you go out. Remember the promises of God's word and prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for what awaits. The time is now. Let's pray. Gracious God of heaven, Lord, we thank you for this this passage here in, in Revelation. Lord, how you are creating a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem for your saints for your people. So Lord, impress this, the truth of this passage upon our hearts. Help us to live obedient to you in this new year that's in front of us. Lord, we thank you for, for blessing our church, for bringing everybody here today, for the baptism, Lord. And we look forward to what you're going to do in our church in the, in the coming year. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to follow you. And Lord, if there is anybody that is here, here today. Lord, we have many visitors. I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would be working in their heart. You'd be working in their mind to convict them that that they are sinners in need of a Savior. That there's nothing they can do to save themselves. No good work will merit your eternal favor. It's by repenting and trusting in God's one and only Son, that we can have eternal life, that we will walk into the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, and the new earth. And if you're with us today and you have never bowed your knee to the Lord Jesus, I want you to know you'll either bow it now or you'll bow it in eternity. And so I want to give you the opportunity to receive him as Savior by saying this this simple prayer. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, desperately in need of a Savior. And I can't save myself, Lord. I know that I've spent my life living apart from you, away from you. But I believe that Jesus died for my sins, that he was buried for those sins, and that he rose again victoriously from the grave. I'm confessing that to you now.